This whole scene was filmed with a practical creature. Really? What? I haven't watched this movie since it came out, honestly. Really? But yeah. <laughs> We lit this guy on fire more times than any stunt performer had been lit on fire in a single day. Wow. What? Yeah. This might be one of the more graphic versions of the shot. No, this is not. <laughs> it was so much better than that. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of Visual Effects. Today, we've got the legendary visual effects artist behind Jurassic Park, Lord of the Rings, Babe 2, Pig in the City, Seth Rogen. Thank you so much for joining Thanks us today. Thanks for having me. Not a lot of people know I do all that stuff, so it's <laughs> nice to get recognized, finally, for all that. Uh, I was 12 years old when I did Jurassic Park. <laughs> so, yeah, it's impressive. So, Seth reached out to us. Apparently, he's a fan of the show, which is incredibly flattering, and I thought it'd be really fascinating to talk to somebody who's been in the mix of it as a director, a producer, an actor, and what their experience has been like working with visual effects. I know one of the things you've talked about is the challenge of trying to communicate ideas to visual effects artists as a director or producer and work through that system. Yeah, there's been a lot of me being just like, it just doesn't look good. And uh, <laughs> this show has helped provide a vocabulary that hopefully uh, circumvents that type of feedback. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, let's jump into some clips. We got some movies that Seth has worked on and been in and some classics. Dude, I've got some fun facts ready to roll out? Uh, always. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's jump in. You did a movie called The Interview. I sure did. Where uh, <laughs> towards the end of it, Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un, yeah. Uh, you, you guys kill him. We, we, we kill him. <laughs> In the most brutal fashion. It's, it's when one visual effect shot becomes the most important shot in the movie. This conversation was ongoing until the day the movie came out, basically. Which actually is a good lesson because they're always like, oh, we need the movie, like, so much beforehand. And we're always like, that's not <laughs> true. We know. You can change a shot 24 hours before the movie is released and, and it works. They make it happen. They get it out there. That looks great. Oh, that yeah. looks really good. Yeah. The shockwave and everything. The, the way the metal deforms. It's, yeah, it's it, a really nice shot. It was really pretty. Classic leaf blower. That's the cool. way he's getting lit on fire. This might be one of the more graphic versions of the shot. No, this is not. <laughs> it was so much better than that. <laughs> <laughs> Why is there so much fire in front of this yeah. head explosion that I'm sure looks amazing, but I can't see? Exactly. So, well, funny story. <laughs> the largest act of corporate espionage in history was perpetrated due to the, this film. Oh, um, that's right. And, uh, yeah, North Korea hacked into Sony. It became, it was an international news story for weeks. And Obama, yeah, I remember there was a press conference leading into the end of the year and we were all watching it. We're like, they won't talk about it. And then they talked about it for literally the entire press conference. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, the, the studio was acting like he would be on their side and he was not. Yes, I think they made a mistake. We cannot have a society in which some dictator someplace can start imposing censorship here in the United States. He was essentially like, they should not have pulled it from theaters. They should not have listened to North Korea and their demands. Like, there's a terrible precedent to be setting. After Obama gave that speech, they allowed theaters who wanted to show it to show it, and they sold it to Google uh, Play to stream it. This shot became the thing that was like, unacceptable like of all the things in the movie like if there was going to be war with north korea based on something in the movie it was going to be because of this shot what the shot was is uh it was like raiders of the lost ark like we built a a, a wax kim jong-un head that had all the layers um, and a skull and brains and all this. And there was and it had, like an explosive charge like in the middle. <laughs> and I remember we like melt, we had like these giant heat uh, like lamps and shit like that. And we filmed it in really high speed and like melted all the layers. Wow. And the idea is it would happen in like a second. Like, ah! And then his head would pop uh, with the explosive charge um, when it got to the bottom that sounds layer. sounds awesome. It was very cool. Yeah, and then this became like the whole negotiation was like, how much of the head do you see? How much do you not see? Can we obscure it with fire? Literally, the, the studios have their own visual effects uh, people and they, they start changing the shot themselves, doing different versions of the shot, showing us versions of the shot. 
Um, yeah, and it literally becomes like a frame by frame discussion. Mm. How many embers can hit his face? How long can it be on screen for? Like uh, by far the thing that I've had the most discussion about in probably any one single part of any movie I've ever had anything to do with. Tell your boss the Green Hornet sends his regards. Hey, Mark. Michel Gondry, I love Michel Gondry. I think his work is incredible. He actually came up, uh, if you ask him, with the bullet time thing before really? the Matrix for a Smirnoff commercial. That's that right, that's right, that's right. The Matrix. Yep. <laughs> the fraction through the bottle. <laughs> then it's got proper to Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> Gondry was great and I learned a lot from him. And although that movie had like a troubled path in some ways, I still love Gondry and it was fun. <laughs> <You know? laughs> There's some cool shit in it. And we actually, I haven't watched this movie since it came out, honestly. Really? But yeah. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> See, there's a classic Gondry shot. <laughs> so Gondry. <laughs> <laughs> we had a bunch of cars. Oh, really? Oh, yes. There was like a few cars that he actually ran across. That was one of those things that you would like show up on set and be like, why is there four of the same car? <laughs> and Gondry would be like, I have an idea. It's going to be cool. Like, All right. <laughs> So this was actually really complicated because the people are moving at different frame rates. You see yeah. the guys falling. Yeah, um, that's crazy. Like, <laughs> that was actually one of the things that Gondry pitched when he first met on the movie, that Cato hits a guy and before that guy lands, he's hit another guy. It's done so well, it almost looks real. It's a crazy effect. And all the bottle pieces are slowly falling through the air too. Yeah. Oof, that rotoscoping nightmare. I know, this is a tough <laughs> scene. Shooting two different speeds to be in the same shot is a really hard thing because if the camera is moving, especially if the camera is moving, yeah. the speed at which everything has to like How to sync them marry. Off and everything. Yeah. yeah, no, it was really complicated. It was a lot of visual effects, building little bits of a jacket oh my and God. shit like that. That guy in front of him when he's going in slow motion, Kato's going full speed. Yeah, exactly. They have to rebuild Kato. Yep, exactly. Oh, <laughs> oh, man. Jesus. I, I have been there. Popeye, go forth. Take these words and spread them. Oh, this sequence, I remember this. This was cool, and how he did this was really interesting. This is, he's like sending uh, like people the word out to go kill the Green Hornet, and like, it's like, these are like his thugs like spreading the word and like <laughs> sending out the army people. Yeah, this is cool. Well, how does this keep? Yeah, <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> I'm watching this, it's cool. <laughs> yeah. It's like, in theory, I totally see how things are happening, but like, I'm failing to see the actual like, Method. Oh yeah, it's really well done. Do you guys know how he did it? I don't. It's a lot more simple than you would think. <laughs> Every frame that splits, they would literally freeze, keep, continue the shot, go back to the freeze frame, and start the next shot. Oh wow. So there, they would just freeze for one split second, continue following Jamie Harris, and then go back to that same frame and follow these two women. Wow. And then it would just keep happening over and over and over and over again, basically. Yeah, so yeah and it's like flawless. you can kind of hide the cut a little bit by having that line come in yeah. because it's drawing your eye away mm -hmm. from the fact that the scene is cutting. Yeah, I think literally it was Gondry being like, freeze! Yeah. Go. <laughs> it's like, it, I'm realizing it actually does require less coordination than I no. initially anticipated. Yeah. Like the films that you've done that have bigger budgets, what's the biggest difference that you've noticed? Time and being able to physically build your sets, I would say, um, are the two biggest things. Green Hornet's probably like the biggest, most expensive movie I've worked on. And you could just see, like we built huge sets, huge things. We had huge set pieces, physical giant things. That, that, that is just expensive, you know, it's hard to do. And visual effects are something that like- Are expensive? <laughs> well, they, they, that, well, that's like, you could do a shot for $10,000 and you do a shot for $80,000. Oh, and you exactly, do the same shot. Right? And, and, and I think that's what a lot of people don't realize. It's not even something I understood until pretty recently is like, we, we really got into the budgets of movies. And we, I remember we were looking at like the budget of like Blade Runner 2049 and their visual effects budget versus is like the Point Break remake. And, <laughs> and I think the same visual effects supervisor did both those films. Huh. And he wow. won an Oscar for one and was probably like ragged on on this show for the other. <laughs> and, 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 and he was the one who was like, look, like this movie had like a hundred grand per shot and this movie had like 
10 grand per shot. Like, which one do you think is going to look better? The yeah. one where they're spending 10 times more per shot? That <laughs> one's going to look better. And that's why visual effects are scary for uh, me and a lot of filmmakers because you don't know uh, what you're going to get necessarily. And, and it's something that you're kind of like crossing your fingers sometimes just hoping it's going to be good enough for you. And, and you just like don't know, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's like the scope of what you can actually get varies so much and yeah. will scale to whatever that budget is. But yeah. unless you're a visual effects artist, you don't really know inherently what that's going to be. No, and, 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 and it's something that, yeah, you're kind of told, like, it'll be good, you'll be happy. And then, like, you get it back, and you're like, I don't think I'm happy. And they're like, well, that's <laughs> it. We're out of money. They won't do it anymore. They're working on something else now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, are you a big fan of Lord of the Rings? Are you a bigger fan of the extended editions of Lord of the Rings? Well, we're basically doing that with these episodes of Visual Effects Artists React. We got extended cuts on the website now. If you want deeper stories, deeper in-depth knowledge, basically everything you love about the show, but just even more of it, well, that's exactly what we have over on CorridorDigital.com. This episode in particular is also going to be extended on the website because you guys left comments saying you wish the episodes were longer. In This Is The End, a giant monster gets his penis sliced off by a laser from heaven. We can't do that on YouTube, but we can do it on our website. You can get a free two-week trial or just start by downloading the app from the App Store, Android and iPhone. And we got some crazy shows on the way too. Oh yeah, that's right. Our show, Son of a Dungeon, our D&D show is coming out in like a week or two, isn't it? It's like almost done. Yeah. But enough about that. Let's get back into this episode. Catch! Ah! Get ready for a surprise! So what year did Total Recall come out? 90. 90, Sum all right. Summer of 1990, I think. Okay. So it's been a minute since I've actually seen this movie. It's a great movie. It's my mom's favorite movie. Okay. <laughs> The thing I remember most from this movie is just like his eyeballs bulging out. Yeah, when the, the Mars atmosphere sucking his eyes yeah, out. Yeah, I remember yeah. that just terrifying me. Three-breasted woman, probably the thing I remember <laughs> as, as a child. I think a lot of people remember that. <laughs> you are now entering a safety zone. No unauthorized weapons allowed beyond Whoa, this. Whoa, that's cool. Yeah, hyper early for CG too, if you think about it. Wow, that's all CG, right? Yeah. Wait. 100%. Wow, that looks good. It's the timing. They yeah. got it choreographed so perfectly. So when they're walking through this shot, they have the dog and they have the dog skeleton. Yeah. And the take that Paul liked the most, the dog actually stops and starts peeing oh, that's on funny. the other side of the screen. <laughs> so the animators had to go in and animate the dog to look like the skeleton is walking when behind the when screen, it was actually peeing. the dog <laughs> stops and starts peeing and the person just drags it along. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's a gun! Nobody's paying attention to the x-ray. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I love that. That was cool. I love that. It's so inventive. So are those 3D models of skeletons? Mm-hmm. Okay, so those are actual renders. Yep. All right, you guys want to hear some cool facts? Yeah. Some cool facts some about cool these skeletons? Facts. Okay, so they did a motion capture with Arnold Schwarzenegger where they put him in a full suit and they put the white dots on him and then none of it worked. Oh, probably. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Just like most motion capture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they're sitting there like, what do we do? And thankfully for all these x-ray scenes, they actually had a camera on the other side of the screen filming the people walking by. Oh. So they had reference footage and they just straight up rotoscoped the animation oh. on top of him. It looks good. It looks really good. And the crazy thing is it's just people going in and matching up those 3D models to his motions frame by frame by frame to get what looks like motion capture. This looks great. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. So let's take a look at another really cool shot here. So this, this is good. getting into Mars. So good. Yeah, it's like it's amazing how far just simply good lighting goes, you know? Yeah. Just having that red light, stopping it at the right moment mm -hmm. really helps marry those two shots together. I'm pretty sure that's a miniature in the background, isn't it? Yep. Oh, for sure. This whole thing is a miniature, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess, yeah, yeah. it's like... <laughs> that looks great. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Did you, did you see that? What's that? There was, there was a merge between two shots. There are two different models that were moving at different speeds right here. Oh, yeah. Oh, and you're that, right. That, like, uh, yeah. was funny, kind of. Yeah, exactly. I'm impressed you caught that, uh, that split run. So this is all filmed in like a warehouse where they built these giant miniatures. And so they have that, you know, the big back painting and they actually move it with the camera so that it feels like it's oh, locked no off. Oh, that's cool. Because things in the background don't move when you yeah, move when yeah, they're yeah. like miles and miles away. And so that's the effect that they're doing there to make it feel like all those vistas and cliffs in the background are actually a super far distance that's away. That's amazing. That reminds me of in Lord of the Rings, their forced perspective mm -hmm. shots with the moving camera. It's all about parallax. I love miniatures and I, I, we're always pushing 
occasion oh. use them and they just don't let you. Really? Yeah, the, it, it's, it's an argument I've lost on many, many, many occasions. Is the argument that like, oh, it's, just it's too, too expensive? expensive? Yeah, okay. it's just too hard, it's too expensive, you need a whole unit to do it. <laughs> so you're saying anytime you see like miniature work in a movie, that's because like, the director producer is just that powerful. Well, it's either like <laughs> such a cheap movie that there's no one gives a shit, or, or <laughs> such an, like, yeah, like, I think it's really amazing. Like, what Chris Nolan does with miniatures is really amazing, I think. And it's a luxury. And I think, like, when you hear people be like, why don't you just do it? Chris Nolan, Quentin Tarantino do it. Like, they, they, they don't let everyone do that. They, they, they're convinced it looks like shit. Oh, the studios have this mentality that like, if it's old, it just looks bad. That's mm. kind of like in general what they mm. think. And they don't like you to use like, what would be considered antiquated technology <laughs> to do things that are supposed to look good. They think their fear is it'll look like kitschy or something like that. And then you're like, well, Chris Nolan used it. And they're like, yeah, well, he's Chris Nolan. <laughs> Did you hear that? Was this monster inspired by Ghostbusters? Well, here's what's funny. This whole scene was filmed with a practical creature. Really? What? That was 100% replaced in post because we just didn't like how it looked. Which is funny, because it goes against everything I've just said. About how <laughs> uh, but yeah, there was a guy in a suit, a demon suit, and it looked amazing. And in real life, it was incredible. It was scary. It was gross. And then the guy in the suit, whenever he moved it just was like not hmm. what we wanted oh, man. i remember we this poor guy like we had a long hallway in the sound stage we were shooting in and like me and evan must have made him run down this hallway like a hundred times as we filmed it and just like again more oh, animally no. again 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 our visual effects supervisor uh paul linden who's a great guy was like i think i can replace this thing with a big ass <laughs> <laughs> he was like, honestly, like, I think you're going to want a big monster here. Like, I don't think you're going to want, like, a little human-sized guy in a suit. And he was right. And then he replaced it with this giant thing, which was very much inspired by the monster from the Ghostbusters to make a very <laughs> long answer. <laughs> I will say, the monster is actually, like, surprisingly good. Like, yeah, it is it does very look really good. We, well, I remember we were so skeptical, me and Evan. I remember seeing, like, the first version of it and being like, Oh my God, it's incredible. Like, it's so much better <laughs> than I thought it was feeling. gonna be, yeah. So did they have to remove the other guy in the suit for those shots or did you film those shots without the guy in there at I all? think we started very early filming it without the guy. I think we took the guy out pretty fast. <laughs> 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 and I think that the guy, we were like, don't worry, it's great. We, we have an idea. It's, a, it's more impressionist. It's like Jaws, the less you see, the better it is. Yeah, it, it turned out really well. It looks really good. Like this shot Look at those was God like, rays. yeah, like this shot was not at all meant to be like that like the dude was like Cirque du Soleil through the background like <laughs> sniffing around the kitchen or some shit like that and like all this was done in post there's nothing blocking those lights in real life it's incredible yeah I remember seeing that shot and it was just like what else can it do can it yeah like, like get his head stuck in the thing and, like we just kept building more and more and more and I remember like this house we weren't happy with and we didn't destroy it at all like we couldn't damage it at all so all the damage you're seeing the house 100% of it is fake you know wow. Dang, no it kidding. was just like a nice house in New Orleans that we were like <laughs> running around Jay and Craig just being like it's over there <laughs> like, I didn't even think about yeah. that but you're totally yeah, right it was like all that was fake um, and yeah they did a nice job with it in the end we burned this dude. I think we burned this guy. I remember at the time the stunt team telling us that we lit this guy on fire more times than any stunt performer had been lit on fire in a single day. Wow. What? Yeah. That's great. We lit him on fire like 18 times or something like that. <laughs> this is largely practical. That's crazy. Which is insane. Fire scary. I have a question about the fire. So as Jonah Hill's like running down the hallway, that actually does look like Jonah's face in yeah. that shot. Is that a digital effect added after the fact? Is that actually Jonah on fire or no. is that the prosthetic? No, it, it was face replacement. We had the guy run down on fire and we had Jonah doing a lot of the same action just in camera. We lined up the shot. Jonah ran at the camera going ar, 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 <laughs> um, a few times. And then we had the stunt guy do the same thing and they used visual effects to match it up and probably rebuild some elements of his face. Because uh, I noticed in that shot right there, the very next shot, it his feels head like a prosthetic. Different. Yeah, we probably just ran out of money on that shot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Which is a real thing. Yeah, it's exactly. like, oh, <laughs> pick and choose your battles. What's interesting though is Jonah is never wearing makeup in any sequence. And oh, this really? whole effect that done to him, like the kind of zombified, uh, like possessed Jonah, is all CG. 
Wow, that looks really good. It, yeah, the whole thing looks good. I'm not just saying that because you're on the couch next no, to me. No, it really does look good. <laughs> Honestly, it was a good lesson because, like, again, it was one of those things we didn't have a ton of money for. But yeah, this dude was on fire on a wire. I love that jump. Jumping down in front of us, and that's all the same shot. <laughs> The fire behind us is fake, I think. On yeah. The yeah. Something that I find interesting about seeing this fire on camera and is part of how I can tell the difference between the practical fire and the added fire later is how it's actually affecting the optics of the lens and the sensor. Mm -hmm. It's flaring out in a really interesting way and actually causing a bit of a color shift. Yeah. It has this like purple haze to it. Uh -huh. Most of the fire I'm seeing here isn't actually generated by fire. It's filmed separately as an element and then tracked into the shot. That fire is. is usually pretty hard to composite and whoever did this did yeah. a pretty good job at that. They did a good job. And there was a lot of real fire in the shot to compare it to, which True. I'm sure made it easier. It's, it's always like, the best. It was mayhem. Like uh, <laughs> Everyone was like, there is way too much fire. <laughs> <laughs> I heard the story about Channing Tatum yes. in this. <laughs> Channing, introduce yourself. Hey, what's up, guys? Y'all cool? It's Channing Tatum. Um, how much time was there between when you sent him an email asking him to be in the movie and when you actually shot with him? Maybe a few weeks. A couple <laughs> weeks or something like that. And, and I remember telling him, like, your guys were in a mask for a lot of it. Like, you don't have to do this. For is, that, is this him for the whole sequence? But in it, it, there is never <laughs> a stunt performer. It is him for two nights. Like, all that, I remember, like, we were very specific. Like, we see your face once for one second. He's like, I want to do all of it. <laughs> That's incredible. All this stuff. And I'm glad he did, because a, a stunt performer would not feel comfortable to grow candy yeah. like that. <laughs> that was the thing that me. I was like, man, that stunt guy's really yeah, exactly. getting into Get it. comfortable, yeah. <laughs> you got to be chanting to do that. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Visual effects are something that, like, it, it's a hard thing to navigate at times. And again, watching this show is, has made it, it, me think of it differently, I think, because you don't often see the movie through the perspective of the of the visual effects people, and it's helpful. So you yeah. think other directors should watch the show? I think they should, yeah, <laughs> if they work with visual effects. Definitely. <laughs> Quentin Tarantino, uh, yeah, you know, Chris Nolan. Sit, sit this one out. Yeah. <laughs> this has been an utter treat. This has been one of the most fun episodes, if not the most fun episode we've ever done. And I cannot thank you enough for being here, Seth. Seriously. Thanks for having me. I mean, is there anything you want us to like, kind of like push the audience to? Like, um, watch the films of Paul Verhoeven. Hey, um, that's <laughs> okay. Okay. I recommend that. Watch Total Recall if you haven't seen it. The RoboCop. It's probably on Netflix. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Yeah, go check out Total Recall.